folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are continuing our study on Matthew 24, and I'm telling you, it just keeps getting longer. Now, we're, and what we've done is we're transitioning now. We've been looking at the time of trouble, or a time of trouble, or the time of their trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's a time of trouble. Now we're going to look at that phrase, which I think is related to it. I think they mean the same thing. Somebody tried to tell me years ago that a trump in the Bible is not the same as a trumpet in the Bible. And they were saying that about 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump. And they said, a trump's not a trumpet. But it says, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. It's the same thing. And I believe the time of trouble is the day of trouble. 2 Kings 18, 13. We're... This is, I'm giving you the context now of a particular time of trouble that King Hezekiah went through. King Hezekiah it was king over Judah, Benjamin, the two southern tribes, and for the most part, a good king. Now, he didn't do everything right. No king ever did, not even David, okay? So those who criticize our current president, let me tell you that I gave up a long time ago ever thinking that a King James only fundamentalist preacher was going to be president of the United States. I don't see that ever happening. I'm not going to be in a full agreement with anybody who's elected president. And I'm certainly not in full agreement with the current president. But I can tell you that a vast majority of the things, not the things that he said on the campaign trail, but the things he's actually done since he's been office, a vast majority of it, I am 100% in favor of it because I believe that what he did was right biblically. I know my pastor friend, Pastor Reg Kelly, agrees with me on that, okay? Now, we don't like the fact he's a billionaire playboy and he's put certain high-profile sodomites in places of high ranking in his cabinet. I am not in agreement with that at all. But even of kings like Hezekiah, the Bible would say, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, meaning God had his favor on him. But then it would follow up and by saying, yet he took not away the high places. There was always something that the king didn't do that God didn't like. But did God curse him? No. We shouldn't expect our version of perfection out of any president of our country, or president of your country, wherever you are. But God put him in office, and so far, he stood up for many of the things that we stand for. Amen? So, here's the setup. 2 Kings 18, 13. Now, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and took them. So now we have God's people in the city of Jerusalem, and we have the devils surrounding them. Think of it that way. Think of you, your family, your church, or our country, or Christianity in general. The world's against us. They're surrounding us. They outnumber us. They don't think that our God is real, and they definitely don't think that our God will save us. The shame of it is, sometimes the way we act, it's like we don't think our God will save us. But I'm telling you, He will. So now, later on, the Bible says in verse 28, Then Rabshika stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spoke, saying, and this is the spokesman for Sennacherib, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. 
And this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. The king of Assyria, make an agreement with me. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. And then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his own fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. And I will, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Hena and Iva, have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? You hear the arrogance? Now, let me tell you. I've heard this before. Something very similar to that. Mike, why are you trusting in the King James? Mike, why are you trusting in the Lord? Why are you trusting in the Bible? Mike, your church, your religion is no different than anybody else's religion. Why? You're just living this fake life. Why don't you just leave that? In fact, come on over to our side. Because we'll put you in a place that's just like what you've got here. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. That's a lie. We have heaven. They have hell. They want you to think that where they're going is just as good as where you think you're going. And he talks about all the nations that we conquered. Did their gods stand in our way to prevent us? No. We took them. Their gods ran. Their gods are not even real. Don't believe Hezekiah. Don't believe your king, people. Don't believe the word of God when it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Don't trust that. I've had that happen. Heard those voices telling me, Mike, that Bible's not real. It's not right. You're on the wrong side. All the other preachers that you know, they use other Bibles. So why are you still holding on to that old King James? In fact, that's why all these uh, preachers that you looked up to, that's why they don't like you anymore. The voice of the devils trying to get you to walk away, making promises to you that they will give you a life just as good as the one you have. Well, think about it. They're wanting you to leave Jerusalem. Why? So they can have it. If their land is just as good as Jerusalem, why do they need Jerusalem? Okay? It's a setup. It's a trap. And I don't care, people, how bad your life gets or got or is. Don't Walk away from God. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Everything that the devils told you was a lie. Just like this devil, Rabshika, did. He's got a spirit all in him, telling, giving him the words to say, telling them don't trust in the Lord. So, the next chapter, 2 Kings 19, verse 1, and it came to pass when Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes, he ripped his clothes, and covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and blasphemy. Remember the beast has the names of blasphemy written on his forehead. For the children are come to the birth. There's that birth again. And there is not strength to bring it forth. 
It may be the Lord God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. He called that time the day of trouble. Now again, I've had that day of trouble before. The devil's driving me to the extent that I was ready to leave the church, leave my wife, leave my family, leave, and, and for no, re no logic to it whatsoever. It wasn't that things were so bad that it was just devils telling me, get out, get out, get out, get out, leave. Literally, I could tell when God made the devils leave. I could feel it. I could feel it. Don't listen to them, people. You know, my, my, my therapy for when that happens to you is get your Bible out. I would tell you to go to Psalms. God may lead you to another place. But go read this book until the devils leave. And then you'll, days later, you'll say, I don't even know why I was ready to go. I have no idea. There's no logic behind it other than the devil just wanted me out. It's happened multiple times to me. And God wouldn't let me leave. And I'm so thankful. So, he says it there in verse 3. Hezekiah, this is the day of trouble. And Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be troubled in the day of trouble. It's not worth it. Don't listen to the devil. Resist him. Now, do you know what happened here? They laid out the words that he spake. They got a letter, and they laid it out before the Lord, and they said, God, you see what this guy said? God, this guy, he's not just coming against us, but he's mocking you. Remember what I said earlier about honoring the Lord's kingdom? Isaiah knew that. Hezekiah knew it. They knew not to pray just to protect their own skin. They knew that it was an assault on heaven itself and God himself. And they said, God, whatever you do to us is fine. We probably had it coming anyway. But they're reproaching you. God, do something about it for your sake. The Bible says that an angel went through and killed just about every one of those soldiers out there surrounding Jerusalem. I love it. Book of Psalms, chapter 20. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. Look at that. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Look at this. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. You see what he's got related here to the day of trouble? He said, some trust in chariots and some in horses. Now, how many armies do you know of right now that's still using horse-drawn chariots? Zero. Now, does that make the Bible irrelevant or out of date? It actually gives us a sight that we've never seen with our eyes. Do you think... You think this Bible's still right? Do you think it's literal? I do. But since there are no armies that are 
currently, and they have no plans whatsoever of having horse-drawn chariots. I do believe that devils in the spiritual realm, there are horses and chariots. In the, in the angelic realm, all, both on the good side and the bad side. Let me tell you what To The Stars Academy is doing right now. Tom DeLong, the Freemason, the rock star, nasty guy, right? Let me tell you what he's got up his sleeve. He's got all these guys that were former Defense Department and CIA working with him because they believe that they have materials from crashed UFOs. They're planning on figuring out how man can achieve and build these chariots that will propel them through the vast regions of space in a moment of time. I guarantee you they are. See, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of our God. They are brought down and fallen. Think about it. But we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Psalm 50, verse 14, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 59, verse 16, But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. See, it's in Psalm 50, verse 15, it's day of trouble. And this is why I said, do the search this way. In verse 16, in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. In verse 17, he says, unto thee, O my strength. Remember what Paul said? 2 Corinthians 12, when he was given to a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. You know what that whole lesson was all about? Paul recognizing that his weak flesh wouldn't last, it wouldn't survive. So it would take God's grace, giving him the strength that he needed to deal with the thorn that he had in his flesh. And since he didn't define it, then we can take the symbols of thorns. We can even the number three, I prayed thrice. Think about that. Lest the flesh, lest the eyes, pride of life. Those are thorns. And God wouldn't remove them. He just said, Paul, I'll give you the strength in your weakness. And Paul said, I'll take it. I'll take it. So I think God wants us to know that in any time when we're in a day of trouble, or a, any time of trouble. God wants to show himself powerful on our behalf. God is just looking for that. But there's coming a particular day and a particular time when God is, go, is absolutely going to manifest his mighty power through all of those who are called by the name of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is the 555th chapter of the Bible. Five, five, five. You know how many times the word Christ is found in the King James Bible? 555 times exactly. You know, all the forms of the word righteous, like righteous, righteousness, Righteousnesses. Type that in, pure Bible search, 555 times exactly because Christ is our righteousness. And here in the 555th chapter of the Bible, Psalm 77, look what it says. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. Skip on down to verse 10. I said, this is my infirmity. Stop right here. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, that that thorn was his infirmity. That's what he said. 
But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. And by the way, what is, how many fingers do we have in our hands? Five. And what is God holding in his right hand? The book sealed with seven seals. So when he says, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High, that means whenever you're wanting faith and courage and help, go to the scriptures and look at how God saved this and God, how God saved these people and how God saved this king and how God saved all of this out of all their trouble. Your answer will be right there. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 86, verse 6. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee. For thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. Isaiah 22, verse 5. For it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls. And uh, stop right here. Can, can you think of a story where walls came tumbling down? Jericho. You know what Jericho is? It's a picture of Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Again, he's saying it twice, isn't he? God speaketh once, God speaketh twice. Babylon fell once when Christ died and rose again from the cross. It's going to fall again in the last day. Amen? When it does, before it does, It'll be a day of trouble. It is a day of trouble and of treading down and perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. And Elam bare the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen. There it is again. And Kir uncovered the shield, and it shall come to pass that thy choicest valley shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. Look at, look at this. In Zechariah chapter 6, I'm not going to read all of this, but there are chariots and horses that are on God's side. They're angels, aren't they? Even, even the chariots are angels. The chariots of the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels, the Bible says. Spiritual beings sent forth from heaven. Remember what Elisha Lift, he, he said, Lord, open his eyes to his servant. Lord, open his eyes. And he looked and he could see that they were surrounded by chariots of fire and horses of fire. Because Elisha had said to him, they that be for us are more than they that be against us. And his servant didn't believe it. He opened his eyes. He's going, okay, I see it now. People, trust me. I'm telling you. All these stories we read in the Bible and these miracles, like what I just told you, we're actually going to see them better than anybody else in the Bible. I believe that. I believe the days that are ahead of us are far better than any of the days behind us, including all of these days here. That's what I believe. He mentioned here uh, th th that Elam bare the quiver with chariots. What's in a quiver? Arrows. What do you shoot arrows with? A bow. Keep that in mind. Because in Revelation 6, when Christ opens the first seal, what do we see? A white horse. Him that rideth it had a bow in his hand. Not a rainbow, one of these bows. I'm going to show you something in a minute. Jeremiah 51, 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And I will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land. Stop right here. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He's, he who's coming, uh, whose shoe lat latchets, I'm not worthy to unloose. Behold, his fan is in his hand, and he thoroughly purges the floor of his garner. The fanner, I believe, could very well be 
Where's the wind coming from? The fanner. What is the fan doing? It's blowing away the chaff off of the grains of corn and wheat that are in the silo. What is that in relation to us? Well, this flesh is chaff. And you see what Jesus, when he comes, he's going to do? He's going to send, he's going to fan and blow off this body of flesh so what's inside can spring into new life. I love that. So look at this. And he will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land. For in the day of trouble, they shall be against her round about. Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. Let the archer. I wonder who the archer is. And against him that lifteth up in his brigadine. And spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts. Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, flee out of the midst of Babylon. You see that in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where God said, Come out from among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. And I would say that everybody who's dwelling inside Chaz, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, where they just took over the heart of Seattle. I'd say everybody in there has got a drunken spirit in them. Oh, I guarantee you most of them stay high as much as they can. I guarantee you they're getting as much drugs shipped in there as they can take. And they, I guarantee you those people stay high all the time because there's no police there. Babylon is a cup in the Lord's hand. He uses Babylon to make people drunk so they believe false doctrine because that's all they want to believe to begin with. And he mentions the archer shall bend his bow. And remember in Revelation 6, the white horse rider has a bow in his hand. And he comes and he takes peace from the earth. He brings war. That made me think of this. Sagittarius, you know, some of you are a Sagittarius, right? Not really. But astrology is this idea that these stars rule your fate. What are stars in the Bible? Angels. In this case, evil ones. The word zodiac, you know, remember what it means? A circle of zoas. Zoa is where we get the word zoo from. What's in the zoo? Beasts. It literally means a circle of beasts. We've been encompassed in the night skies by devils. One of them is an archer named Sagittarius. Look at what Wikipedia says. The Sagittarius, the Greek word is toxates. The Latin is Sagittarius is the ninth astrological sign which is associated with the constellation Sagittarius and spans 240 to 270 degrees of the zodiac. Under the tropical zodiac, the sun transits this sign between approximately November 23rd and December 21st. Greek mythology associates Sagittarius with the centaur Chiron who mentored Achilles, a Greek hero of the Trojan War in archery. Sagittarius is an archer. Sagittarius, the half human and half horse. Dun, dun, dun! He's the beast who is also a man. Is the centaur of mythology. The learned healer whose higher intelligence forms a... Look at this. The learned healer, Sagittarius whose higher intelligence forms a bridge between earth and heaven. Dun, dun, 
time. Sagittarius is represented by the symbol of a bow and arrow. Now, ain't that interesting? Because he says here he's half human, half horse, beast and man. He's the learned healer. And everybody that's ever followed UFOs, they absolutely believe that these aliens are of such high intelligence that they're actually coming here to change mankind, bring us into a new age. I've got a new book that's put out by Whitley Strieber. I just started reading it today. But he promises the aliens after, get this, 33 years, have informed him apparently that we're about ready to enter into a new age and the aliens are going to lead the charge. Look at this again. The, this, this angel, this devil, Sagittarius, is the bridge between earth and heaven. You know, that's the exact phrase that Jor-El, Superman's father, in the movie Man of Steel, said of his son Cal El. E-L means is the name for God. It's the Hebrew name for God. And you know the two guys who invented Superman? Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster? They were both Jews. Okay? So they knew what they were doing. But he said of his son, Superman, Cal, you're the bridge between our world, Krypton, which means secret, the heavenly world, and earth. You're the bridge. You're going to bring the two peoples together. Ezekiel chapter 7. Also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And mine eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abominations shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This is what God's going to do to Israel. He's going to make their sin so obvious that they're going to know that he's God. Thus saith the Lord, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God, An evil, and only evil, behold, is come. An end is come, the end is come. It watcheth for thee, behold, it is come, the morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Again, he's linking the time of the end with the day of trouble, and he's saying it's near. Do you believe that? I do. I believe the day of trouble could be very near. How near? I don't know that. We'll wait on the Lord. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. So when you're in trouble, is it better to be outside of the ark or inside the ark? Inside the ark. The ark is Christ. Is it better to be in the Lord in the day of trouble or outside of the Lord in the day of trouble? That's what he's saying. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, look at what he said, the days of Noah, the overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you imagine against the Lord? And he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, that's the second time we've seen that, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Da, da, da. You know who the wicked counselor is? The opposite of wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That's who he is. The wicked counselor is the Antichrist. And notice in this passage, in the day of trouble, God's going to take all of these, he, he's talking about thorns and, you know, like bushes, all brought together and folded together. Well, that's exactly what 
God's going to do with the tares first, not the wheat, the tares. And when he finally has them all joined together, then the wicked counselor is going to come forth out of the midst of them. Look at Habakkuk chapter 3. And I'm almost done. Verse 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Remember what we said. There are known organizations like To The Stars Academy, and I guarantee you others, probably in places that we have no idea what's going on there but they're working on wanting to build these chariots. These chariots. They're going to use that as their defense, maybe to fight a battle, maybe to leave this planet to go someplace else in hopes of escaping what they refer to as Armageddon. God says if they do that, I'm going to bring them back down, saith the Lord. Look what he says in verse 9. Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Now look what he says in verse 14. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Think about that. They're rejoicing. And by the way, that's what happens when you sow to the flesh. You'll reap the whirlwind. And that's connected with this. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. Think of the flood. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Now, all the days of trouble that I've been through, I've never rested in them. But I believe my Bible. I believe that a day of trouble is coming. and That God is going to bless his people and they will be able to rest when the whole rest of the world is in turmoil. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. I believe that. Study the day of the Lord. And hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of cloud. There it is again. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Now the last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Paul says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Talked to somebody one time and they asked me a question. They said, you know, the Bible says be fruitful. But they said, how can I do that? How can I make myself be fruitful? And I said, you can't. The phrase, be fruitful, it's not an order, it's not a commandment. It's a blessing. You know, when Jesus, when they asked Jesus to, uh, you know, hey, Jesus, wake up, we're in this boat here and it's fixed to be overturned and we don't know what to do, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus came out and said, peace, be still. Now, was he requiring all of the disciples to maybe flap their hands against the wind to stop the wind or to do something to make the wind stop? No. He was proclaiming a blessing. And when God speaks it, not even hell itself can stop it. And that's why they were so amazed. He's got power even over the winds and the rain. And what he says has got power in his word. He's got power. That's what really set with those disciples. 
He didn't say, hey, do this now. Take your oars and fan against the wind, and maybe it'll stop. God helps those who help themselves, right? No. So I, I told this person, I said, God's not ordering you to be fruitful. He's blessing you. And I guarantee you, in some way, you are fruitful. It may not be in the way that you want, but God, when he blesses you and says, be fruitful, I promise you. Since you can't do it yourself, he's not expecting you to. Just his word going forth will cause us to be fruitful in our lives. Guarantee you. So take that same concept now. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not commanding them to have peace. He's blessing them with peace because he said it. And when God speaks it, it happens. So he said, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our what? Tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You understand what that means? God's not ordering you to be comfortable he's not commanding you to figure out a way to get through tribulation he's blessing you so that all the tribulation and all the trouble in the world can come your way and it won't come naive psalm 91 you read it that chapter is right it shall not come nigh thee. For God will give his angels charge over thee and shall keep thee in all thy ways. And then, after we've gone through that, we can then go to others and comfort them the same way that God comforted us. So, a lot of pretty rough, bad things have happened to me over the span of my life. Some of it was my fault. Some of it wasn't. But even in the stupid mistakes that I made, like when I had back troubles, was taking all that Percocet, all those painkillers. God had a reason for that. Because then I find myself sitting in a room with a bunch of drug addicts alcoholics, people who have suffered depression. And I didn't want to do that. I thought I was better than them. But God humbled me. And I sat and listened to every one of them. And with some of them, I was able to be a blessing in a day when they needed a blessing. I didn't know, but there was a young man who was there with me in every session. I had to do this for like six weeks, three times a week for two hours at a time. And on my last day, he said, I've never met anybody like you. And he said, I've watched you and I've listened to the things that you said. And he said, you've helped me tremendously. I started crying. And I have that young man's phone number. And every now and then, I still reach out to him and say, hey, how's it going? I've been praying for you. I hope you're doing well. God made me care for drug addicts and drunks and people who live all kinds of horrible lifestyles. So the very comfort that God comforted me with in my day of trouble I'm able to comfort them the same way. Don't, don't despise and ask God, God, don't, don't give me any trouble. I can't handle it. But rather ask God, God, will you carry me through? And I promise you, no, God promises you that he'll give you comfort. Okay? 
So I'm not saying to you right now, be ready for a day of trouble or a time of trouble. What I'm saying to you is when it comes, if you're really of God's kingdom, God will watch over you. And it won't be anything that he's going to make you figure out to do for yourself because he knows you can't. He'll do it all for you. That's how we know he's the right God. Amen. I've enjoyed this study. Thank you for listening to me these two hours. May the Lord bless you. Think Bible. Pray for our ministries in Kenya and around the world. We love you and you're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.